Uh, it's indeed, a, again, a real privilege to introduce our colleague and friend, the Assistant Secretary of Labor for OSHA, David Michaels. Uh, thank you so much, Dave. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back here. I was here 18 months ago. I go to speak at many meetings around the country. This is the most exciting meeting on worker safety and health in the entire country. Thank you for coming here. Thank you for your work. Uh, I, my applause is to you. I, I bring the, the warm regards of the new Secretary of Labor, Tom Perez. Um, if you were at the AFL-CIO uh, International Convention, uh, recently he spoke there, spoke about the importance of worker safety. He is a firm believer in your rights, and um, he sends his regards. I also want to thank your leadership, and particularly Leo Girard and, and Mike Wright, who you know, who do a spectacular job moving the ball forward, making sure that workers, not just in the steel industry, not just in the telecommunications industry, not just in the nuclear industry, or the chemical industry, the oil industry, the paper industry, but so every worker in the United States has the right to a safe and healthful workplace, and they deserve our thanks. You have a most impressive program. The, um, the Steelworker Emergency Response Team just does very important work, and I know everybody here was moved yesterday seeing and hearing about you know, your brothers and sisters who were killed on the job last year, and following up and getting the lessons learned Getting the root cause analysis is something that no other group does, no other union does, and is so important for every one of us to understand that. And um, it's important for the people who died, for their family members, to see that response, to know that those deaths won't be forgotten, that at least something can be learned so someone else is saved as a result of that. And I want to personally thank them and the members of that team, because it's hard work to go in following a fatality and do the interviews and figure out what happened. And I hear stories that there are some employers, even VPP employers, who give members of that team a hard time, who don't let them in, who, don't, who aren't responding, even after the death of one of the workers, and that's outrageous. And I personally want to thank the members of that team for the great work they do. We're all grateful for it. Um, you know, the OSHA law is very clear. The OSHA law, which is 42 years old now, says employers have the responsibility to provide a safe and healthful workplace. And every worker in the United States, no matter who they work for, no matter what their legal status, no matter what language they speak, has the right to a safe workplace. And, and that's, my job is to make sure that takes place. But, but we know it's a, it's a big challenge. I think we're, we're getting somewhere. I mean, you know, 42 years ago, before the OSHA law, 37 workers died every day in workplaces in the United States. 37 workers. Right now, with a, a workforce twice as large, we're down to about 13 or 12 or 13 workers a day. It's still 12 or 13 too many, but together we've made progress. There are employers who are doing the right thing. There are unions that are fighting hard for safety and health. There are professionals. There are every, all across the country, we're working on this. We're making progress. But 13 deaths a day is 13 deaths too many. And you saw pictures and you heard the stories of dozens of members of the steel workers and the communication workers who died just last year. We're here today to make sure that next year, next time we do this, we don't have those same fatalities. We need to stop those deaths going on in the workplace. So I, I have to tell you that this week, one employer has been very much on my mind, and that's Republic Steel. And I think you've heard, you know, in August, a little over a month ago, the middle of August, we issued citations including willful violations for violation of our, violations of our fall protection standard to Republic in, in Canton, Ohio, at their plant there. And the fine was $1.14 million. That's a big fine. That's because there were willful violations of our fall protection standard. And the reason the fine was so big is we had been in their Lorraine, Ohio facility a couple years before and saw other fall protection violations. And we issued a fine of half a million dollars at the time. And clearly, Re Republic didn't get it. And even though we've signed agreements with them and they say they're fixing things, we issued a one point, you know, $1.4 million fine. And then, just a few days ago, we heard that another worker fell 40 feet 
only survived by the grace of God. We can't let these things go on. So I know we're back, there are a number of different facilities that Republic owns. Now we've just opened up an inspection in Massillon. We are taking this very seriously. We put the company in our, our severe violators program and we're gonna do everything we can and work as closely we can, as we can with the steel workers to make sure not a single additional worker at any of those plants is injured. And I wanna thank you for your cooperation in getting there. You know, Dave McCall, who's the steel worker director for Ohio, said, we always prefer to work, work jointly on safety and health with, our, with employers, but when they refuse to correct the conditions that threaten our members' lives, we're thankful for OSHA. And we appreciate that sentiment. Our job is to enforce the law, and we are committed to strong, focused, and fair enforcement. I far prefer to send our inspectors in before a worker is killed or seriously injured. I don't want to go in after that man fell 40 feet almost to his death. We want to get in there early and find the hazards and make sure they're abated, and employers should want that too. Now, there are a bunch of, of OSHA staff people here from, from our Cleveland office, from our Pittsburgh office. If you don't know your area office director and the staff at your OSHA area office, you should get to know them. They are your allies. We need you. You need us. And we need to work together. So when you get back to your your cities, to your plants, reach out to OSHA if, if you don't know them and call them up, say you want to meet them, you want to know who to call before your member for, falls 40 feet to, to their, and is disabled for life. Um, you know, we know OSHA enforcement is effective, and we know there are studies, and our studies show that. There was a study done in California that said when an OSHA inspector goes into a high hazard plant, the injury rate goes down for the next four years. Not only that, it saves the employer money. In fact, two uh, professors from business schools, one from Harvard, one from Berkeley, did a study and said, every time OSHA goes into a high hazard plant, we save the employer $350,000 in, in workers' compensation costs. Now, employers don't get it many times. They think that we're actually, that we're gonna kill jobs. We, OSHA doesn't kill jobs. OSHA stops jobs from killing workers. Now, we talk a lot about these injuries and we talk about fatalities and we see them and they're as tragic as can be. The thing we don't see sometimes are the occupational diseases. The ones that, that occur 10, 20, 30, sometimes 40 years after exposure begins. And they're just as tra tragic. They're just much harder for us to deal with. Uh, just a few weeks ago, OSHA issued a proposal that we've been working on for quite some time to reduce exposure to silica in workplaces across the country. And this will affect hundreds of thousands of workers across the country. Silica is a terrible, terrible um, dust. We're not talking about sand, you know, sand is silica, but we're talking about particles one one hundredth the size of a grain of sand. And when you breathe it, it gets deep into your lungs, it causes a disease called silicosis. It causes lung cancer, and causes lung cancer and silicosis at levels far below what our current standard allows. I am very fortunate, you are very fortunate, that one of your brothers, Alan White, um, who worked in a foundry in Buffalo, New York, and was exposed to silica for many years and developed silicosis. Alan is a courageous man. He came to Washington to testify about that, to tell the world what silicosis is like and how we have to protect workers in foundries and every type of other industry um, against this, this terrible danger. And I'm very grateful that Alan came to Washington and helped us announce this standard and, and will help us push this standard through. Um, it's a really fabulous thing. Um, so we're making progress. We're making progress on, on silica. We're making progress on beryllium. I know beryllium is a, a, another terrible exposure, causes a berylios, a chronic beryllium disease at very low levels. And uh, the steel workers and Materian, which is the biggest beryllium producer in the United States, have come together, negotiated what they think is a very reasonable way to, to protect workers from beryllium. They brought that to OSHA, and now we're working with them to turn that into a standard. That's the way it should be. 
Unions and employers should come together and say, how do we figure out how to protect workers? And I'm very grateful to the steelworkers and to Materian for doing that. Um, and I think we'll see some real progress there. You know, this really is the theme. You know, we've made progress. We have a long way to go. Um, one thing that I started talking about when I was here 18 months ago, and I think we've, we really have made some progress, is on getting rid of these incentive programs, these rate-based programs that give people money at the end of a period because they have a low injury rate. Or sometimes it's not even money. I've been in, in hotels where the workers tell me, if no one's injured this week, or if, let me put it this way, if no one reports being injured this week, we're going to have pizza on Friday. What that does is that tells the workers, if they get injured and report it, not just that worker, but their other workers are not going to get some benefit. And it can be as little as a slice of pizza, but it affects the way people think. And what that, those programs do, they don't discourage injuries, they discourage injured workers from reporting their injuries. And if an injury isn't reported, that worker is never going to see workers' compensation. If that injury isn't reported, no one's ever going to investigate it, we're not going to learn anything, and we're not going to stop the next worker from being injured. So we've made it very clear, we don't like these programs, they have to stop. Uh, so we raised this in our VPP program, our Voluntary Protection Program. We said, if you're the best of the best, you certainly shouldn't have a program like that. Now, there was a lot of squawking, and a lot of management people, and even some labor people said, well, you know, it's very important to have these programs. I think what was going on is people looked at this as part of their salary, because they'd always get the money. We think there are lots of great things you can incentivize. You can incentivize being involved in a training program. You can incentivize hazard identification. You can incentivize hazard abatement. But if you incentivize not reporting injuries, then people aren't going to report their injuries. I heard about one, um, this was a gas drilling operation in New Mexico from our state consultant there who told me that the, person, the company that ran that operation said if no one's injured over the next three months, everybody, every contractor, subcontractor, will get a month's pay as a bonus. Let's say you're injured eight weeks into it. Are you going to report it? <laughs> I'd say not. So in VPP, we announced this program. People said it was a terrible idea. We, people, we're going to have companies fleeing from VPP. Well, that hasn't happened. We've had well over 100 establishments say, we could change this, and they did. They got rid of those incentive programs. And only a tiny number of employers said they couldn't do it and, and left VPP. A couple left voluntarily, a couple we asked to leave. But we showed it can be done. Every one of you should go back and look at what's going on at your workplace. And if there are these programs, let's figure out how to get rid of them. They don't work. They just hide injuries, and they have to go. Now, employers don't want workers to report injuries for lots of reasons. And we see some pretty nefarious things going on out there. And um, another issue that we're looking at right now are companies that have policies, sometimes they're not written or they're written, but we just don't see them, that bring workers up on charges when they report injuries. We've seen this in the railroad industry, and we've, we've taken it on there, and we've seen it at AT&T. And we have two dozen cases of members of the communication workers and other workers at AT&T at across the Midwest who, when they get injured, the first thing that happens is they're brought up on charges and disciplined. And they're, we see what's going on here. These are, in many cases, safety rules that are never applied except when so someone's injured. Or the, and the safety rules are things like, well, you weren't paying attention. We think what's going on here is workers are reporting their injuries, and the company's policy is to discipline them, no matter what the cause, no matter who is responsible. And what that will do, well, that will, that will make sure that if, if workers are injured in the future, they're not going to report them. So this is a violation of the law. We've made that very clear. We filed cases against AT&T. We're negotiating with them now to both eliminate all these, the discipline against these workers and to change their policy. But if we don't get satisfaction, we will go to court and litigate. We have, there is no question. We have to do this. Another area that I think we're making great progress is in dealing with temporary workers. And this really is an issue that's facing all of us across the United States today. You know that there are three million workers 
temporary workers today working in the workplace. And they obviously have fewer rights. They face significant hazards. They are vulnerable to safety and health hazards, much more vulnerable than workers in unions who have rights. Now, that's the rhetoric of it, but we see the reality. I've seen case after case of a temporary worker killed on the first day of their job. Or if not the first day, the second day or the third day. I'll give you an example. At the Bacardi Bottling Company in Jacksonville, Florida, and it's a big company, they know how to operate. They, they have, um, they, they put a lot of different liquids, primarily rum, into bottles. Bottles break, there's a lot of glass around. They called up a local temp hiring agency, said send some people over to help us clean the plant. You know, we're just sending over people not particularly skilled, they're good janitorial work. The first day, there's a 21-year-old named Lawrence Day Davis, who's known, to, known as Day to his friends. They give him a broom and they point out the palletizer and they say, you see all the glass underneath that? Sweep that out. Well, over the palletizer is a big sign. It says, danger, do not enter. And a lot of things about lockout, tagout. This is a 21-year-old kid who's never, he's never heard the term lockout, tagout. The foreman says, go in there and, you know, broom out all the glass. What do you think he did? He went in there with a broom, started to clean it up. The machine was turned on somehow. His first day on the job was his last day on earth. And I wish I could tell you that was the only story like that, but we see him over and over again. There's a, a fellow named Samir Story in, in South Carolina who sent by a temp agency to a paper plant. And they gave him, a, according to the news reports, they gave him a, um, a brief sort of tutorial on some of the hazards, and supposedly they gave him the answers to the, the quiz they gave him at the end. They, they gave him a respirator, sort of showed him how it worked, but didn't really work. He went to a tank, he was overcome by fumes and killed, the first day on the job. Now this is not a surprise when you think about it. We've known for a hundred years that new workers are at greater risk of injury. And that's why we insist on training, and people shouldn't operate any equipment till they're trained. You can't operate a forklift till you're trained. You shouldn't be able to operate a, a power press or anything like that until you know how that machine works and you're trained to work safely. Well, when an employer calls a temp agency and they send someone over, in the employer's mind, they're thinking, well, this person's not going to be here for too long, right? Maybe a week, maybe a day, maybe a week. In some cases, maybe five years, because that's the way the world is working right now. That person's always going to be a temp worker. But whatever it is, I believe that employer is thinking, why put the resources into this person who doesn't work for me? She doesn't work for me, so I'm not going to do the training. Well, that's against the law. If a worker needs to be trained, they have to be trained no matter who's paying the bill. They can't operate the machine or be near that machine until they're trained. Now, I know one of the reasons employers use temp agencies is they don't want to pay the workers' compensation costs because the temp agency has lower rates because it doesn't look like they're in a high hazard business. So they're pushing those costs onto the temp agency. They bring the worker in, don't give them the training, and So we've got to stop that from happening. So we are taking this issue on. I've told all of our inspectors around the country when they go into a workplace to ask if there are temporary workers there, are they exposed to the violations? And we're going to start pulling that string, going back, we're going to look at temp workers, as employees of both the temp agency and the host employer and issue our fines accordingly. And we've reached out to the, all the temp agencies and tell them we have to follow the law. We're telling host employers the same thing. If temporary workers are coming into your workplaces, you have to make sure they deserve and they are required by law to be given the same training that everybody gets. And, and, that has, and that training, by the way, has to be in a language and a vocabulary that they understand. Because over and over again, we see temporary workers being brought in who don't speak English. How can they be protected? They have to be trained in a way they understand. And we appreciate your help doing this. We have to take this on. Now it's, so thank you for your work on that.
And, and I'm very glad that I'm told there are representatives of day labor organizations from all around the country who are here today. Thank you for coming and thank you for your work. You are at the forefront of protecting these most vulnerable workers. Uh, um, now finally, I want to say a word about looking for trouble. And you saw a little bit of that um, video here that I think you've heard about yesterday. The comprehensive model safety and health program that steel workers are putting together. This is great. Um, it's about time to see this sort of of forward thinking on the part of this union. This union has always been in the forefront of protecting workers. And, and putting together this comprehensive program, I think, will make a big difference. I think the name is really great. That's what we're all doing. We're looking for trouble. We want to find it before someone is hurt. And we look forward to working very closely with Mike and, and Jim and, and your team, because this is a great team. And I know together we're going to save lives. So it's a good thing we're doing. So thank you all for that. So let me just go. Let me just end with one thing. You know, um, OSHA has this very wide mission. You know, I tell people we do everything from nail guns to nail salons. You know, because every worker in the United States has that right to a safe workplace. It's a challenge for us to follow these things. So, I, I've been following the poultry industry pretty closely. You know, because this is a place where conditions are pretty tough. But something else is going on in the poultry industry. Um, I saw that the the Butterball Company, you know, they make turkeys, has put together a committee for the humane treatment of, of turkeys. Now, the, the real name should be the humane treatment of turkeys before they're slaughtered, right? Because that's, that's the point of the Butterball Company. But everybody's talking about, you know, let's, let's treat the animals well. And you go into the supermarket and you see big signs for the, um, the free-range chicken and the cage-free eggs and the assurance that, you know, this, everything is being done well for the turkeys. But if you go into those poultry plants, and you see workers making cuts with sharp knives at lines going 140 birds per minute, you know what the outcome is going to be. The National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health just went into a poultry plant, and they found that 40% of the workers had signs of carpal tunnel. 40%. By the way, not a single one of those cases was on the OSHA log. But we know what's going on in the poultry plants. And those are the most vulnerable workers. Those are non-English speaking workers in many cases, hired because they're not going to complain. Producing you know, all these inexpensive chickens that we eat every day. And so people are justifiably concerned about the chickens. But the message that I'm trying to give you and I try to give Congress, and I want every one of us to take home and tell our families, tell our neighbors, tell our members of Congress, tell our political leaders, it's time to think not just about the health of the chickens, but let's think about the health and safety of the workers in every industry in the country. So thank you all very much, and thank you for this great meeting.